Okay, thank you. Well, I would invite you, if you have your Bible, to take them, turn it, to Genesis chapter 5. I would also invite you to stand for the reading of God's holy word. Genesis 5, 1 to 32. I hope you guys are ready for this riveting passage. Strap yourselves in. But in all seriousness, this is the reading of God's Word. It begins in verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named the man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Adam that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived, after he fathered Enosh, 807 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. And Enosh had lived 90 years. He fathered Canaan. Enosh lived, after he fathered Canaan, 815 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. And when Canaan lived, had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. Canaan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 840 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord God has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters, Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. Noah was 500 years old. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Well, this is the reading of God's holy word, and all of God's people said, Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we read a passage like that and we realize there are more people with more names than we can remember off the top of our heads. And yet, Lord, each and every one of them is important. It's recorded in your word for a reason. And so we pray, Lord, that as we explore this passage this morning, that you would open our eyes to see what it is that you want us to see. And most of all, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes to understand more of the gospel and to receive it and to see the beauty and the glory of our own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, more clearly because of this passage. We ask that, Lord, and we ask that you would give us of your Holy Spirit during this time as we hear your word preached. We ask this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, if I had to guess off the top of my head, my guess would be that the genealogical lists in the Bible are probably not the top of your priority list when you read the Bible. And if I had to make another guess, maybe when you read these lists, whether it's in this passage or last week's passage, or all nine chapters of the first part of First Chronicles of nothing but list of names, if you bother to read it at all, you probably might be tempted to just read through those names and just let your mind glaze over as you read mindlessly through the names, wondering who could possibly remember who these people are or what the significance really is. Well, if that's you, you're probably not alone. But since all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching and for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, as Paul tells us about the Old Testament in 2 Timothy 3.16, then that would include this list of genealogical names. This list is profitable for us today. And the overarching main idea, if you're visiting with us and you don't know this, we type these in the bulletin under sermon idea, right under the liturgy. The main idea of our passage this morning is that despite the reality of death, we are called to live a life of worship and holding to the promises of God. That's really the main idea. Despite the reality of death, we're called to live a life of worship, I'm going to add, to walk with God and hold to His promises that He makes to us. And that's what we want to unpack this morning from this genealogical list. So I want to begin our first point, uh, the generation that calls on the Lord. And I actually want to begin in the last two verses of the previous chapter. In chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. I want to go back there. I, I know that that properly speaking, was last week's passage, but it does form the backdrop of this passage in this list here. And it says this, Adam knew his wife again, so this is after the death of Abel, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring or another seed instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And so what we see right there in verse 25 is we see this is a generation that calls on the Lord through an appointed seed. Now one of the things we've highlighted several times in this, this series on Genesis this year is that oftentimes when we, when we see names in the Old Testament, those names mean something. And oftentimes the Old Testament gives us the meaning of those names. And that's exactly what we see here in chapter 4, verse 25, with the name Seth. She called his name Seth. And then look at the description. For, she said, so it's giving us the explanation, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel for Cain, killed him. Seth's name literally means he appointed. God appointed. In other words, Seth is the appointed one. He's the continuation of the line of the seed of the woman in place of Abel. Obviously, Abel was killed. Abel had no children. And so his line is essentially cut off. But look what God does in the face of death, under the reality of death, God appoints another seed to carry on for the seed of the woman. I don't know if you've picked up on that little nuance there, but it's interesting how one is put to death, another is raised up. And so through this seed, through this appointed one and his line, people begin to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, we have to ask ourselves, well, what does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? That's really what verse 26 highlights as part of the backstory. Now, what that really essentially means is that Seth's line, through him and his son Enosh, 
have a special relationship with the Lord. And it's a relationship that is categorized by one word, and it characterizes what we're doing here this morning, and it is worship. That, that word worship characterizes the relationship that Seth and his line, his godly line, the seed of the woman, have with the Lord. Now, it's, it's really interesting. Calling upon the name of the Lord is used in other places in Scripture. Abraham, it, it's used of Abraham in Genesis 13.4. Abraham builds an altar and calls upon the name of the Lord. It's worship terminology. Later on in Genesis 20, 21, 33, Abraham plants a tamarisk tree, and then it says he calls upon the name of the Lord. He's worshiping. We see it used as well in Psalm 116, verse 17. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9 looks forward to a time when when after the judgment of Israel happens and they are restored, uh, all of the Gentile nations will be saved. And what it says is, for at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that's the Gentiles, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve Him in one accord. And I'll just give one more example from Zechariah chapter 13, 9. Um, by the way, it's right after he says that the shepherd will be struck down and the sheep will be scattered, which is quoted in Matthew about the Lord Jesus Christ. God says, And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. Talking about some of the Jewish people. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. All of that, brothers and sisters, to just illustrate to you that by calling on the name of the Lord, these early patriarchs in this genealogy at the beginning and the head of it maintain a faithful witness and worship of the Lord as His people. But anytime somebody seeks to be faithful to the Lord, anytime somebody seeks to maintain that witness in a fallen, broken world, there are challenges. And these, these saints are not exempt. In fact, if you look at chapter 5, verse 3, it summarizes the birth of Seth. Moses writes this, When Adam lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after the image, after his image, and named him Seth. Okay. You know, the way that that is worded should give you pause. As I, as I read from the very beginning of this sermon, the whole passage, if you remember back in verse 2, it mentions God, in verse 1 as well, God making man in his image, hearkening us right back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, or 27 and 28. Man is made in God's image. Male and female, he created them in the image of God. But then you you see something change in verse 3. Adam, when he's 130 years old, fathers a son, the appointed one, naming him that, Seth. But notice what it says about Seth. He fathered a son in his, that's Adam's own likeness, after his image and named him Seth. Notice Adam is said to be created after God's image, male and female. But Seth is made in Adam's image. And maybe you wonder, well, so what's the point? Well, it's a subtle point, but it's an important one. What happened between Adam's creation and his bearing or or fathering Seth? The fall. What this is meant to highlight by saying, not that Seth is made in God's image, but saying Seth is made in the image and likeness of his father, Adam, is that Seth has inherited a sinful nature. He's inherited the consequences uh, of sin, which is condemnation and death before the Lord. That is his natural inheritance before 
God. And what this does is it goes to highlight and reveal to us that even though they are the godly line of Seth, even though they are the godly seed of the woman and not the wicked, evil seed of the serpent through the line of Cain, they still need grace. They still need grace. And the other thing that adds to the challenge, not only are they, are they maintaining a faithful witness and, and a testimony of worship in a fallen, broken world, despite their own sin, they're still trusting in the Lord, but they're doing this in a hostile environment. If you remember last week when we looked at Cain's wicked line in, in Genesis 4, now it wasn't as many names given, it was six or seven, but what you find is Cain, his line is characterized by worldliness. His line is characterized by violence. His line is characterized by sensuality. His line is characterized by murder. This is the context and the backdrop by which the seed of the woman in the line of Seth begins to call upon the name of the Lord. And that leads us to verses 6 through 20. And and no, I'm not going to read through all of those names again, mercifully for you. But we do find a list of six names from Seth to Jared. And there's not much we know about these people, which is why I'm not really going to comment at length and speculate on each of these people. But there's one detail I want to draw your attention to in that large chunk of our passage There are six names mentioned, and five times we find the refrain, and he died. And he died. Boy, that's really the the ultimate challenge (coughs) of maintaining this testimony and witness of worship in dying in a fallen world. They're doing so living under the, the sentence of death. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but these people have incredibly long lifespans. But despite these long lifespans, every single one of them dies. Now, I thought about this when I was preparing this message. Like, would I want to live that long? 965 years. You've got to wait like 130 years to father a child. But I like to wait that long and live that long. Here's my, here's my answer, honestly. I don't think so. You know why? I'm only 41 years old. But, you know, the, the short lifespan I've, I've had up to this point, fighting sin has been hard enough up to now. Why would I want to fight it for a hun- hundreds and hundreds of years and, and continue under that knowing that I'm going to die for that long? But again, you see the grace of God at work because these expansive lifespans did enable them to have many children and still continue to fill the earth with life, albeit with their limited lives. Did you notice that other detail? I was just like, every one of these guys, after he fathered so and so, lived, you know, such and such amount of years and, and had you know, other sons and daughters. This isn't the only, like these line of names aren't the only people existing on the earth. Each each generation, each iteration is producing multiple, multiple, multiple sons and daughters to fill the earth. And that is God's grace, even under that sentence of death. And so I wanted to ask the question as we look at this, namely focusing on, on Adam and Seth and Enosh, what challenges do we find to faithfully worshiping the Lord in our own day? Well, we, we are plagued by the same challenges of living in an unbelieving world, and I would say which introduces all kinds of, de- of idolatry and all under the sentence of death. We have the same, nothing has changed, essentially. And that, that's what I want you to see. We call upon the Lord through an appointed seed. Don't miss that. That, That's one of the the applications that drives us to the gospel in this passage. When we take a collective look at the seed of the woman, the idea of a brother being killed and another being raised up by the Lord and appointed by Him is an amazing picture of the coming of the ultimate seed of the woman who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. 
Like Abel, Jesus was put to death by his brothers, the Jewish religious leaders, as well as the Gentiles, like the Romans. And like Seth, Jesus was raised up by the Lord and appointed as the head of all that follow and all who are born again of him by the Holy Spirit. Boy, this genealogy begins to make sense when you understand how this points to Jesus Christ and and the fact that there is a need for us to be born again. There is a spiritual genealogy. It's called the book of life that was recorded in heaven. And one day when all of us stand at the judgment seat, that the books will be open and your name is either in the book recorded that you have been born in the spiritual line of the seat of the woman, the appointed one, who is Christ, or it's not. Well, this really begins to, to become very real for us. We see the gospel play out in this genealogy. You know, Jesus fulfills everything that the name of Seth is meant to entail. He was the appointed Messiah. He died for our sins on the cross. He rose again from the dead to give us life. But you know what's even more fascinating to me? Is that you look at these expansive lifespans and you think, if maybe you're different than me, and you think, wow, it would be really cool to live that long. But you know what the life that Jesus offers as the the new appointed seed, the Messiah, is far more superior. Because at the end of the day, when eternity comes, you and I are not going to live 800, 900 years. We're going to live forever. It's going to be eternal life. And it's going to be an eternal life not plagued by the threat of death, not plagued by indwelling sin in us that we have to constantly wrestle with. It will be life as God intended it to be in the garden. What a hope. But despite this hope, we still have the same challenges that are faced back then. We are called to live faithfully in an idolatrous and unbelieving world. Don't miss that, that, that background of the, the Cainites, the line of Cain, the seed of the serpent lurking in the background of this genealogy. The same is true of us today. We live in an unbelieving world where, as we saw in 1 John chapter 3 last fall, people are either born of God or they are born of the devil. And again, these are spiritual realities. There's no secret that our times are becoming darker and darker as history marches forward. Sin is being embraced more and more. And interestingly enough, all in the interest of self-fulfillment, self-realization, which I think is just another way of saying selfishness. <laughs> and, and none of us are exempt in this room from being selfish, if we're honest, in our jobs, in our relationships, in our families. We live in a time in which worship is not a high priority on most people's minds. If you were to look at somebody's bucket list of what do they want to accomplish before they die, are you really likely to see worship on that list? But what I don't think most people realize is the things that they idolize in the world are the very things that they worship. And it really leads to kind of an application question to kind of diagnose where your own heart is at this morning is what are you worshiping this morning? Are, are you worshiping, you know, the pursuit of, of power in some way? Uh, are you worshiping the pursuit of wealth uh, or pleasure and sensuality as the Canaanites were? Or are you worshiping a covenant God who sent his son, the appointed seed, Christ, so that you might be his and that he might be yours. One will satisfy, the other will not. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is, what, what is it that we are worshiping this morning as we live in the same context of an idolatrous and unbelieving world? Well, it leads to our second point this morning in verses 21 to 27, we don't just see a generation in through Seth that calls upon the name of the Lord. We also see a generation that walks with God. 
And I'm going to be um, intentionally narrow in my focus this morning. I'm, again, I'm not going to go through all the names. I want to focus really on Enoch. And I want to focus on verses 22 and 24 this morning. And look, look at Enoch is the seventh patriarchal fo- uh, person from Adam. But look what verse 22 says. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. And then you skip to verse 24. Again, Enoch walked with God, but this is different, and he was not, for God took him. Well, what does it mean to walk with God? Well, it Kind of similar to calling on the name of the Lord, but with a different shade of nuance. It tells us that Enoch walked with God. By the way, after when it says after he fathered Methuselah, there's a really important implication there that I think if you're just reading through a list of names, you you might miss. It means that he likely lived as any other man would have before he fathered Methuselah. And what that implies is there was likely a conversion experience in this man's life at, how old was he? 65 years old, isn't that what it says? 65 years, he fathers Methuselah. 65, 65 years, and he walks like every other man. By the way, there's many commentators that point this out. There probably was nothing that that set him apart from those around him those first 65 years. You'd never pick him out in a crowd as being something special. But something happened, and we don't know what it was because Scripture doesn't tell us. Maybe it was just the fact of having a child. I don't know. I've had men tell me that when they had their first child, it changed everything in their life. Maybe something happened there. But there seems to be some kind of conversion experience, some kind of turning point in his life, and that the result of that is he walks for another 300 years in the closest communion with God. Hmm. The phrase, he walked with God, is interesting because the only other person in Scripture that it says that about is Noah, believe it or not, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. Commentators Kyle and Dalich explain this phrase this way. They say it describes the closest the most confidential communion with God, walking, as it were, side by side with Him. Now, it's not the same thing as walking before God. It's walking with Him. Later on, the phrase is used of Abraham in Genesis 17.1 and Genesis 24.40. God tells Abraham, walk before me. He doesn't say walk with me. And and walking before God is living a blameless and a pious life under some divine law or some divine command where there's an expectation that must be met. But but in this stage of history, there's no law that was revealed, like Paul said in in Romans 5, which, which we read earlier. There was no law to transgress. And so Enoch didn't walk before God. He walked with God as a friend. Now, that's really unique. He's the first one, the Scripture says, did this. And again, he walks with God among an ungodly generation. Going back to that same challenge, he lived at a time when the Canaanites were were in the the, the land. Now, I want to draw this out to you and make some comparisons with this Enoch with some people from Cain's line. And the first one I want to compare him with is Cain's son, Enoch. If you remember that, back in chapter 4, verse, um, well, what would that have been? 17 and 18. If you remember, Cain's son, Enoch, had a city named after him where obviously worldliness thrived. But the Enoch of Seth's line walked with God. He didn't have all the honors and pleasures and power and wealth in the world. Didn't didn't have a city named after him, but he walked with God. Two very different legacies, huh? Now compare this Enoch 
with Lamech from Cain's line, the last name, well, the last main name that's listed. Our Enoch is the seventh generation from Adam through Seth. The seventh generation from Adam through Cain was Lamech. What a contrast. One lived for the flesh. One was worldly. He was sensuous. He had two wives whose names, very names, invoked this imagery of pleasure while the other lived for the Lord, walking with Him. And one of the things we know He did in this ungodly generation was He preached. If you're like, well, where did you, where did you see that? Well, you have to go almost to the other side of the, the Bible to find that. Jude 14 and 15, Jude is only one chapter, so verses 14 and 15 say this. And by the way, Jude is warning about false teaching and the judgment to come because of that. He says, since in the translation of Enoch, an example of immortality, no, that's the wrong quote, I'm sorry. <laughs> he says, it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. What did he say? Jude tells us, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. He likes the word ungodly, doesn't he? And of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You know, Jude tells us by divine revelation and divine inspiration that Enoch was a preacher of righteousness to an ungodly generation. And what is he saying to them? There essentially is a judgment that is coming. What was he looking forward to? Well, he says right here, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones. He speaks out against the wickedness of his own day. He warns of judgment to come. I would imagine calling them to repentance. But it's interesting to me that he correctly understands that the seed of the woman is the Lord himself. Genesis 3.15, you know, the seed of the woman who is going to come will crush the head of the serpent. And all this time, you know, Eve back in chapter 4 when she gave birth to Cain thought that Cain was going to be that seed of the woman. Mistakenly. But Enoch here seems to understand the seed of the woman that's coming, even though he was part of that line, is not ultimately him, it's really ultimately the Lord himself coming. And what's, what's he going to bring when he comes? Well, in his mind, he's bringing judgment on sin. He's bringing judgment on sin. But we don't just find this, this reality of him walking with the Lord. We see there's a mystery to walking, walking with God as well. Look at verse 24. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him? Well, what does that mean that he was not, for God took him? Kind of a cryptic phrase. Simply means that God in his grace delivered Enoch from death. He translated him directly to heaven and took him out of this world. Do you realize, I, I've always said to people, you know, um, when people are like, well, everybody dies someday. Well, not everybody. You cannot say that humanity has suffered the threat of mortality 100%. There have been two people that did not die and went straight to heaven. Enoch is one. Elijah is the other who went up in a chariot of fire in 2 Kings chapter 2. They went alive into heaven. Immediately into glory. How about that? That's what it means that God took him. The Enoch is the only one in this line where that constant refrain, and he died, is not said of him. John Calvin, the French reformer of the Reformation, states this, Since, in the translation of Enoch, an example of immortality was exhibited, there is no doubt that God designed to elevate the minds of his saints with certain faith before their death. And to mitigate by this consolation the dread which they might entertain of death, seeing that they would know that a better life was elsewhere laid up for them. They had no idea of knowing what was after death until this example of hope gave them 
to show them there is a life after death, and it's meant to be a life of communion with God unhindered in glory. I was listening to a, you know, those little videos you can easily fall into the trap of just scrolling in on, on YouTube. Um, I saw one this week uh, with, um, oh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Neil Tyson, um, help me out here, Degrassi, is that his name? Um, he's a smart guy. But they were asking him, he's a scientist, he, and he was in this interview, and he's like, well, what happens after death? And he said, scientifically, nothing. And the interviewer was like, so you don't believe in life after death? No. Well, then what's it like after death? And he responded, well, what was it like for you before you were born? I thought that was an interesting way to look at it, but a very dark, cold way of looking at it. This is a man who has no hope, as smart as he is. And this passage shows us and speaks so clearly to us that walking with God is meant to point us forward, in this case with Enoch, is meant to point us forward to the fact that when God took him, there is an eternal life to be gained by walking with the Lord of life. The Lord who stands outside of creation and above the laws of science in nature. And so what does it look like for us today to walk with God? Well, it means continuing a deep fellowship with Him in light of the coming judgment and the coming resurrection. You see, our faithful worship should fuel a deep relationship with God to build the application from our first point to this second. You know, worship is clearly turning from the idolatry that we all suffer from, that we mentioned before, and it fuels, that kind of worship fuels a deep and abiding relationship with our God. There's something about Enoch that continues, just like Seth, to point us forward to the coming Redeemer. Our walking with God comes through Jesus Christ who freed us from the curse of sin and death so that we might walk with Him. And don't miss this. It means that we are called to live differently than the world around us. And this means that there should be a stark contrast between the life of a professing believer on the one hand and the rest of the world around him on the other hand. There are some of us who are tempted to want the world's acceptance. There are some of us who are tempted to just want to fit in and keep our head down because we don't want to be different. And believe me, I I understand that temptation. I'm sure there's more of us in this room now that have that temptation than would want to admit when we're all together. But it is a reality. But this passage calls us to something different. Walking with God. And what what fuels that? Our fellowship with God should be driven toward the hope of eternal life in the resurrection. You see, Enoch was preaching, as Jude tells us, uh, of a coming judgment when God is essentially going to judge the ungodly. And that is certainly true. That is certainly true. You know, what's interesting to me is, you know, we have these ways that we want to, as Christians, appeal to the lost all all the time. I think they're like the seeker-sensitive movement. They will never talk about judgment, the judgment of God. They will never talk about sin. They will only talk about the positive things and hope that they can draw people. Well, look, talking about the love of God and, and His care and compassion... For a lost and dying world, there's nothing wrong with talking about those things. We need to. But we cannot miss the fact that we are preaching to people who are under the sentence of death, who are under condemnation, and are under judgment. And when we look at Enoch here, and we see the hope that he he lived and then was translated to glory under, it gives us hope for those of us who have repented of our sin. For those of us who have come to Christ, the Messiah, the ultimate seed of the woman. Because you and I no longer live under the sentence of death and judgment, which we saw in Romans chapter 5. We have a great hope. And it's the hope of the resurrection that we have. Death does not have the final word. 
God is not angry with those who are in Christ because He took the anger for them. What an amazingly positive gospel we have. And we don't just die with Christ according to Romans 6. We are risen with Him to newness of life. Brothers and sisters, as you live your lives, every one of us wrestles with some kind of besetting sin. There's no perfect person in this room. If somebody comes and tells me they've arrived and they're sinless, we need to go to my office and have a talk. (laughs) There's amazing hope in the fact that the power of sin has been broken by the death of Christ and the fact that you've been risen with Him, you are no longer slaves to sin, you are no longer slaves to death, but you have become servants of God, endowed with His life, His freedom from sin. So that as you live your life, you don't have to live under the fear of the sentence of death, even though we die physically. What does Christ say? I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, John chapter 11. You know, he who believes in me will never die. And even though he dies, and he's referring to physical death, he will not die because he has eternal life in Christ. Which leads us for us to verses 28 through 32. Our third point, the generation that hopes in God's promises. We have a generation that that calls upon the name of the Lord. We have a generation that walks with God. And now we find at the end of this line, a generation that hopes in God's promise, even as they look forward to eternal lives themselves. Look at me at verse 28 and 29. We see the expression of this hope in a final birth. When Lamech lived 182 years, this is not the Lamech of Cain's line, When Lamech lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord God has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Okay, I I, I tend to think he had a little bit less clarity than his father Enoch had on the promise, but he's still holding to the promise, isn't he? It's one more example of, of the principle. What does Noah's name mean? Rest. Thank you. Rest. Noah's name means rest. We're seeing the pattern of of people looking for the coming seed of the woman who would destroy the works of the devil. And here Noah's father, Lamech, is hoping that his son would be the one who would give them rest from sin, rest from the curse on the ground in their work, and rest from the power of death. This is a man who's holding out hope. Ten generations from Adam. This is finally the one who's going to give us rest. Now again, we'll see in chapters to come, he was clearly mistaken, but he's still living out the promises of that hope. And the context of that is in the fact that he does not live to see the promises of God that he's placing his hope in. Lamech dies before he sees what comes of his son. In fact, it's ironic that Lamech dies even before his father Methuselah dies. Methuselah lives, if you do the math, Methuselah lives right up to the flood. In fact, it's kind of interesting when you read all the rabbinic debates, if you, if you have the stomach to even wade into that. I mean, some of it can be nauseating, but some people say, and I don't know how they possibly know this, that Methuselah lived until five days before the flood. Others say seven days before the flood. How do you figure that out? I don't know. But he lived right up to the the flood. Lamech never lives to see what his son comes to. And it just illustrates the point that he lived by faith and not by sight. He lived hoping in promises. And that, that leads us really to the final question driving us to our application. What does it mean to wait on the promises of God for us today? Well, it's pretty simple. It means being faithful despite not seeing the fulfillment of those promises. We're called to be faithful, brothers and sisters, whether we see the promises of God fulfilled in our lifetime 
or not. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say to me or around me in my little lifetime um, that we're living in the end times. I think Jesus is going to come back in my lifetime. Well, maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. I remember at my last church, we had a gentleman in our church who was very political um, and posted a lot of stuff online. <laughs> and, but he would, would, at church, I remember he would just always say, you know, we're living in the end times. I think Jesus is right about to come back really, really, really soon because he saw what was going on politically in America. Well, you know what? Saints have been suffering a whole lot worse for a lot longer in other parts of the world. I thought, oh, maybe. Maybe not. But if he doesn't, are we going to remain, if he doesn't come back in our lifetimes, are we going to remain faithful? That's really the question you have to ask yourself. In Hebrews 11, in the New Testament, when you read through it, it's a passage commonly called the Hall of Faith. One of the primary themes that the author is highlighting as he lists a bunch of Old Testament saints is that they put their hope in the promises of God and never lived to see those promises revealed. Do you remember what Jesus said to some of his disciples? Look, many kings and, and prophets and righteous men longed to hear what you hear and see what you hear or see what you see, and they did not. Now, we do have a leg up on these Old Testament saints because we have seen the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, like them, we are also waiting for the Lord to give us rest from the painful toil of our hands from the ground which the Lord has cursed. The earth is not entirely redeemed yet. It will be. Paul says in Romans 8, 19-22, he says, For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, that's God, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the sons of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Did you miss, did you see that or did you miss it? What he said, he said, God subjected the creation in hope of the coming of the sons of God. We don't often hear about God hoping in scripture, but he says it right there, doesn't he? What's God looking forward to? What's he waiting for? What's he hoping for? He's waiting for the, the glory of the sons of God to arrive. He's waiting for the work of Christ to have its leavening effect in this world so that people like you and I, who are sinful, can be saved and then revealed at the end of time. This is the same hope that Lamech had. We're essentially waiting for the return of Christ where the new heavens and the new earth and the final redemption of our bodies will happen. Some of you are sitting here and that hope is, is a very real thing right now. Some of you maybe are dealing with a crippling illness that makes you wonder where God is. Some of you maybe perhaps are in a situation in life and you don't know how God is going to show up and how God is going to redeem it. Maybe it's a situation at work. Maybe it's a problem with your marriage. Maybe it's, it's something with your kids or a neighbor. And you feel like you're toiling away for nothing. Well, brothers and sisters, the exhortation here is to wait upon the Lord to fulfill His promises. We live in a, mi I call it a microwave society. You put food in for 30 seconds and it's ready to go. You get it now. We're not good at waiting. We're not good at waiting. It's hard to wait. And it's even harder to wait knowing you may not see the realization of all of God's promises in this life, but the question remains, will you be faithful? Because part of the promise that Lamech was looking for has been fulfilled. In Hebrews 4, it says that God has already given rest to his saints through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
You're not laboring to earn God's favor. You're not laboring and working to earn your salvation. It has been given to you as a free gift. You rest in Christ, which is why we're here today, to remember that, that we rest in Christ, and yet we look forward to a greater rest when he returns and brings us into our our eternal inheritance. And so the point is we press on and press forward to the prize that is Christ with whom our life is hidden in heaven. That's the whole point of this passage, isn't it? Despite the reality of death, we are in Christ and called to a life of worship, a life of walking with the Lord in Christ, and a life of holding to the promises of God. That's what this genealogy points us to. Let's pray.